My backstory is probably very similar uh, to the backstory of, of, of many of you here. Uh, I started my professional career as a teacher in 1989 at a terrific school, well-resourced, great students. Um, it had been founded in 1919 by a really visionary uh, uh, educator named uh, Helen Parkhurst in Dalton, Massachusetts. Um, she was a disciple of uh, Maria Montessori and John Dewey, and her dream was to bring into existence a school that really exhibited all of the principles of progressive uh, educational philosophy, experiential learning, um, student-led teaching, uh, constructivist uh, uh, sort of uh, project-based um, experiences and so forth. Um, not that surprisingly, by the time that I got to Dalton in 1989, um, the teaching and learning had uh, sort of retreated to a little bit more conventional uh, structure. Um, that said, uh, we had pockets and I'll come back to this in a little bit, pockets of incredible innovation still taking place that were really deeply connected with the vision that uh, Ms. Parkhurst had uh, used to create the school. The one that really stood out to me as, now, you have to picture this. I'm a young, right out of college, <clears throat> high school history teacher. I've been given a textbook that's 30 years old. And my job is to stay one chapter ahead of the kids and essentially retell the previous chapter to them and then test them to make sure that they got the story, right? This little classroom here, uh, if you can call it that, um, was to me sort of my inspiration as an early teacher. When I wasn't teaching in my classroom, I went to go see the third graders in a, the back of the lower school excavating a Greek ruin in a little sandbox. Now, the ruin was actually souvenirs from museums that the teachers had sort of uh, pilfered over the course of many years. But what I discovered was these kids had an experience with history that my high school students never would. They were unearthing the constituent pieces of the past and constructing their own narrative understanding, rather than what I was doing, which was giving them the narrative and then maybe a couple of examples of why the narrative must be true. The other thing that was very interesting to me was these kids were learning all sorts of skills they weren't supposed to learn. So my favorite moment was when a bunch of kids unearthed a uh, Greek, uh, a shard of a Greek uh, vase, and it had Greek uh, words on it, and they insisted on their teachers going to get the high school Greek teacher to teach them how to read it so that they could decipher the clues that were on the pottery shard. So this was the early 90s, and it was the birth of the internet and this new multimedia thing. And so I began to work with some brilliant educators, and I was sort of the token uh, technologist at the time, to take that experiment that, that we were doing in this little you know, five square foot sandbox and create a virtual version that would be five square miles uh, and bury a really robust treasure trove of multimedia artifacts in there, allow the students to excavate them digitally, and then go online to a uh, multimedia library, uh, but not just online, to, their, uh, to the um, physical library down the street to the Metropolitan Museum to try to decipher what it was that they found in the site. And the results were just breathtaking. But I'm talking to the choir here. You know this. Each one of you in some way or another has done something similar to this. But remember, this was, this was 1991, 90, right? So as a result of this work, we got a big grant to try to build similar progressive digital learning environments across the whole curriculum. And we did things like created uh, um, multimedia versions of Shakespearean texts that were linked to historical performances. It allowed students to record their own versions of the performances, link them to the text. One of my favorite projects was something called Project Galileo, uh, where we were using uh, the internet to download images from the Hubble uh, Space Telescope. And we had an 11th grader in 1991, I'll never forget, named Hillary, who discovered an undocumented planetary nebula through this technique in a windowless New York City classroom. This was a learning revolution, right? Almost all of us remember this. We were there. Um, and this was, in, I think, 93 or 94, Time Magazine covered some of the work we were doing, and many other places that were doing this kind of work. We were certainly not the only ones calling it a learning revolution. And the learning revolution was not about taking technology and pumping more content into the brains of these kids, uh, nor was it about somehow um, more expertly drilling them on basic skills. It was about combining really high quality representations of the world in which they lived with very sophisticated digital tools to allow students to answer questions for themselves, to create their own meaning of the world around them.
So, you know, as I said, we were certainly not the first, uh, nor the last, nor the only ones doing this. I mean, we spoke about Papert's groundbreaking work, which certainly uh, long predated the stuff we were doing. You know, George Lucas started to talk about an edutopia in which this kind of learning was just de rigueur. Even companies like Apple began to redesign their technology, their products, to be able to capitalize on this new paradigm of learning. But, and this may just be my interpretation, this is sort of the wet blanket part of the presentation, Fast forward, that was 20 years ago. The learning revolution, it didn't happen, right? We're still here talking to each other about the same things that we were doing 20 years ago. And I don't say that in, in any way to make people feel like I'm being critical. Um, the technologies are better. Um, I, certainly there are cooler things going on. But for the most part, the, the paradigm has not shifted. I thought it was going to happen in 1992. Here's a Wordle word cloud of uh, the 2001 No Child Left Behind legislation. And you can take pretty much any ed education, national education manifesto between NCLB and today's National Education Technology Plan, throw it into Wordle. For those of you who don't know what Wordle is, it, it, the largest words here are the ones that are most prevalent in the text that you, put, you pay, paste into it. So this is the language set of American K-12 education right now, public education. It's about standards. It's about success, developing effective skills, students and teachers who are college ready, principals as leaders, districts. And there's nothing in here about creativity, constructivism, progressivism, innovation, leadership. Those are the things that have made this country distinctive. Those are the things that will make us competitive or collaborative in this century and beyond. So what happened? Well, and you know, Dennis and others have started to talk about this today, and this is sort of the 800-pound uh, elephant in the room. We began, and when I say we, I mean those of us who were operating in very high-functioning laboratory environments with kids who could pretty much do incredible stuff if you never even walked into the room. Around us, we were living in the midst of a crisis of epic proportions in American history. We're still living through that, right? You know these statistics. Everybody does now, right? 40% of black fourth graders can read, right? We have a lower than 50% graduation rate in urban school districts, much worse for black students. And the problem is, so if you think about this, there's really two problems in one. One of them is that American children are completely ill-prepared at the most basic skills and the most basic competencies. But more worrisome than that, the gap in terms of basic proficiency between our black and non-black students, between our impoverished and non-impoverished students, is large and it's growing. And the societal impacts of that are enormous. OK, that's bad. But to me, there's actually an even worse problem if we look at it from a historical standpoint. And that's that there's another achievement gap that we don't talk about as much. We're starting to now. And that's that when you look at our students in comparison to their international peers, we're falling behind every single day. And again, uh, to your earlier point, Homer, you know, whether it's uh, competing or collaborating, we're not, we're not, we don't have the skills to be at the table, right? 19% of children who entered ninth grade this year will ever graduate from a four-year college, ever. More startling and worrisome to me is look at US uh, sort of uh, 15-year-olds in comparison to their international peers in math and in problem solving, in problem solving, 26 out of 29. Fewer than 2% of US students scored in advanced on the 2009 NAEP test, the first time that NAEP actually measured science. Not a lot of Einsteins to be found here. This is a dramatic problem. Now, this is where I think there's a bit of a moment that's arrived and where I've kind of come out of some of my despondency and started to get very excited about the opportunity. And, and, and let me, it's a little tricky, let me try to explain this as best I can. Over the last few years, there is emerging, there's an emerging hypothesis that's turning into a consensus that these two skills gaps, let's call one the basic skills gap and the other one the 21st century skills gap, just for lack of a better way of labeling it, that these are not separate problems the way that we have been dealing with them. Right? So if you think about the last 20 years, the reason that progressives have gotten shunted to the side is because we've been focused as a nation laser-like on the basic skills gap. Well, what we're finding now, and this is just two quotations from recent research. One is from Elena Silva from uh, uh, Education Sector that was looking at measuring 21st century skills. 
The other one is from very interesting Gates, uh, preliminary findings of Gates, measures of effective teaching study, both of which say, hey, the best learning we're finding through research happens when students learn basic content along at the same time that they learn how to think and solve problems. Teachers who are producing gains on the state test, code for basic skills measurement, are generally the ones producing deeper conceptual understanding. And so the very thing we saw in that classroom, in that sandlot back in 1990, where kids were learning skills they weren't supposed to learn, it's been happening all along. But somehow we haven't been telling the story effectively. So I was, in tr I was very tickled when uh, uh, Heidi Hayes Jacobs uh, used the number two pencil. I agree. I think the number two pencil is largely to be blamed. But you got to think of the number two pencil and the scan sheet as primitive technologies. right? So what am I working on now? It sort of brings me up to there. I've left the private school domain. Um, I work exclusively with public schools now. Uh, I work with public schools and public school districts all around the country trying to take the types of innovations that we were working on 20 years ago, but I've added a component to my work, which is how do we assess in a robust, authentic, and meaningful way the learning that's taking place across both of those sort of spectrums? All right. So I don't have the time to go into detail on it here, but these are constructivist learning environments that we, we've created, project-based learning environments in which there is authentic assessment tools uh, and analytics built right in. So think about Google Analytics hooked up to my old archetype, right? Um, so what are the results of this work? I mean, we're starting to see some emerging research about these uh, uh, sort of um, uh, the relationship between the two skills gaps and how they can be addressed together. Uh, we're starting to see some new types of assessments and new types of digital learning platforms uh, sort of make their way into classrooms. What are the success stories? Well, it's very early. And I hope I can be here 10 years or another 20 years from now uh, talking to you about all the su success that we've, uh, we've had. One place I wanted to mention is Albemarle uh, County um, in uh, Virginia, uh, um, uh, which is basically uh, Charlottesville, for those of you who know Virginia. Um, <clears throat> And they're one of the districts we've worked with that I think has done the most interesting work around uh, sort of this topic. Um, 1999, uh, the superintendent and, and really the district began to recognize what many districts were recognizing, which is that they had were ex sort of suffering from low proficiency in basic skills, math and ELA specifically, and that they were also experiencing large achievement gaps. And worse than that, the, the progress had been static. Right? They tried a lot of different things. For the most part, it was static. Um, <clears throat> they have a very dynamic, uh, visionary uh, superintendent, Dr. Pam Moran, uh, who I'm, I know is following us because she's been tweeting uh, on the uh, Wafiti board uh, all day, um, who introduced technology-rich learning, project-based, constructivist principles systematically throughout the district. But she did something else, and this is what I'm urging all of you to think about doing as well. She began demanding that her principles measure higher order thinking collaboration 21st century skills, and worked with companies like ours to develop technologies to actually measure that type of learning. So you'll see down at the bottom of the screen, um, we, we now support a number of mobile apps where trained observers can go into the classroom and look for uh, higher order thinking, collaboration, uh, student interaction, quality of language, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that data is just as important as the benchmark assessment data. And more importantly, you can look at the two together. So what are we starting to find? Again, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't uh, defend a PhD dissertation using this slide, but this is, this is indicative of a direction and I think an invitation to study this further. So if you looked before 1999, you would have seen pretty much the same thing, right? So this is third grade blue, fifth grade red, um, proficiency at um, uh, mathematics, uh, below 70% in third grade, below 60% in fifth grade with a high achievement gap, 30%. Um, after the interventions and after they really started to emphasize a higher order learning, she's had really significant, significant growth, uh, both as measured in the basic skills, the blue and the red, but also as measured in, in a tightening of the achievement gap. Um, and I'm, I'm often skeptical. of I, I do a lot of analysis of district's data, and I, and, uh, I can tell you all the reasons why uh, there are problems with the way New York City represents its data than other districts. Um, this is pretty solid stuff, at least um, from a first glance. Uh, a lot more research needs to be done uh, to va validate this. And this kind of work is starting to take place in many different districts around the country. 
Um, so I guess uh, <coughs> in closing, and I know I'm out of time, I would sort of amend my earlier, more pessimistic slide by saying it's not that the learning revolution didn't happen. It's that perhaps it only has the opportunity to become a revolution now, on our watch. Um, and I know this is a controversial topic and one that, that, that folks struggle with, particularly those of us who consider ourselves to be progressives. I guess what I would urge to all of you who are part of this revolutionary movement is don't see assessment, measurement, accountability, the need to validate your work as the enemy. Number two pencil, fine. <laughs> Embrace assessment because I think that if you do it right, you can tell a story that no educator has been able to tell up until this point historically. And I think we're burying the lead if we don't do that. So with that said, my final words would be, Viva la Revolución. <laughs>